you are about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. Time to return to the days of yore, when the Wild West hid danger around every corner. It wasn't just the terrain or the dodgy liquor, or even the gunslingers you had to watch out for, for lurking in the shadows were some scary creatures. John LeMay returns to discuss a bunch of bygone encounters with werewolves, hellhounds and dogmen across the Americas. We've encounters with a collection of creepy creatures, cursed peasants, witches and much, much more. But before we saddle up with John, don't forget, you can support Mysteries and Monsters by signing up for $4 a month with Patreon at patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. $4 a month gets you ad-free episodes, early releases, bonus content, and much more. You can also click the link in the show notes as always. Thank you to my latest patrons, Simon, Mose, and the marvellous Eerie Edinburgh. And if you haven't checked their YouTube channel out, I'll put a link in it to the show notes for all your ghostly goings on north of the border. Mysteries and Monsters is across all social media platforms. Facebook, Twitter, Mastodon, Instagram, and please subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube. You can also visit mysteriesandmonsters.com for news, updates, and episodes. Thank you as always to Dean Bestor for his marvellous artwork. The show is produced by the amazing Brennan Store of the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. So, our silver bullets are packed. There's a sprig of wolfsbane in our pockets, and we ride out in the company of John LeMay on the hunt for werewolves. Time to saddle up and head back out on the search for more jaw-dropping encounters in the Wild West with John LeMay. His latest trio of books cover a wide variety of weird encounters with skinwalkers, werewolves, vampires and more. It seems that it wasn't just whiskey fueled gunslingers you had to watch out for back in those days. John, welcome back. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Hey, it's my pleasure. As we were joking beforehand, it's always nice when people want to come back. And you said, well, it's nice to know that I wanted you back. But it's, I always take it as a, as a great boon when a, when a previous guest returns and, uh, and we can have another great conversation. Well, and I can tell you have a good listener base because my sales boosted right after our last show. So thank you to anyone listening who bought the the books last time. I appreciate it. Clearly, my listenership have great taste, John. Oh, (laughs) thank you. (laughs) So obviously, last time we spoke, it was, as I mentioned to you at the time, John, you were somebody I'd been aware of for quite a while with these wonderful stories that you'd been uncovering and and your work in this particular field and the way it's kind of developed. Um, And we we kind of dove into this beginning of the the whole Cowboys and Monsters series of stories that you'd begun to uncover because obviously we discussed that you've got a real love of of history, both in some of these stories and and the history of films and things like that. So when we were, were diving into this, you kind of teased us that you were coming down the pipeline with a trilogy based on that particular book that we discussed last time. Yeah, so the book we talked about last time was uh, Cowboys and Monsters, Vampires, uh, and Werewolves of the Wild West. And, uh, you know, it's basically a collection of old newspaper articles or folklore that are real that I just examine and try to determine best that I can, you know, over a hundred years later, uh, you know, how likely is it that these things actually happened? And, uh, you know, what people may not know is these old newspapers from the 1800s and early 1900s, they had stories about UFOs, about Bigfoot, about lake monsters and dinosaurs and even vampires and werewolves. So it's really quite amazing. I think it's one of those really surprising aspects of this because I don't know whether it's just my presumption, John, but I would imagine that people just wouldn't expect there to be any stories like this, never mind how many they are, because when I've had the privilege of of speaking with Adam Benedict, who I know you've mentioned in, in some of your previous books that you've done, because Adam's obviously uncovered several stories of a similar nature from from the 18th and 19th centuries which are quite surprising but 
I suppose there's this idea that people have, a lot of people, especially outside of the USA, they have this idea of how the Wild West was and what was going on. So when they discover that there's such a rich litany of, of these stories all over the place, they're, they're very surprised because it's just not what you would expect to uncover, I, I, I surmise. It's, you know, it's like they say, there's nothing new under the sun. And just like today, how we have fake news, well, we have a mix of fake news and real news to where sometimes you don't know what to believe. But back in those days, in the golden age of newspapers, what they would do is throw in made-up stories for entertainment in between the real articles occasionally. Mm. And like the, sometimes they would write these made-up stories kind of tongue-in-cheek where you could, you could guess, well, this is just satire. But – the problem is, you know, when they write articles about Bigfoot back in the 1800s and they correlate with, with uh, our ideas of Bigfoot today perfectly, you have to say, well, maybe that was a real story. Mm. And same with the UFOs and the airships. So there's um, – I would say of all the quote-unquote weird stories that we see in the old newspapers, maybe half of them are true or true at least in the sense that there was a real witness who claimed to see this and, and what have you. And then maybe half of them are just totally made up by the newspaper writers. So that's one thing I try to be really careful about because if I uh, try and tell the reader that all of them were real, they'll lose respect for me because obviously some of them are just way too far out. But I So that's my take is about half of them are real stories or, or at least the witness thinks it happened. Then half of them are just totally made up for entertainment. That's my, my belief on it. Mm, I think that's a good starting point. Because one of the things that I'm always surprised about, is when you look back at this, I remember speaking with David Weatherly, and we were talking about a particular series of articles that appeared towards the end of the 19th century where they were talking about Gorilla Mountain and Gorilla Mine. And people have kind of poo-pooed it and said, oh, well, people will have read about the discovery of gorillas in Africa, and, and therefore they were just sort of spreading these tall tales. But as me and David were discussing, a lot of people in those days couldn't read. John. So they wouldn't be able to read particular newspapers, and especially if you're in the Midwest or somewhere, I, I find it very hard to believe that your local paper is going to be carrying articles about gorillas running around. Yeah, I've found that it takes more contrivance to try and explain away <clears throat> these you know, cryptid stories than it does to just accept them at face value and say, well, there is a creature living in the woods that for whatever reason we can't catch and we can't find evidence of, but Obviously, if everyone sees it over uh, centuries, there has to be something to it. You can't explain it away. Mm. Yeah, there's always a kernel of truth in, in a lot of these reports. And, uh, I mean, obviously, at the moment, you've got uh, a certain scientific study that's gone around saying, well, I think everybody's mis misidentifying bears, which is one of those things that I often find, well, if you specify looking at encounters without looking at any of the supporting evidence, like how close the witnesses are, what the creature allegedly does, how it behaves. It's very easy to give a positive study for the, re for the result you want, John, rather than actually looking at the cases more than just saying, oh, well, they saw something odd, therefore it must be a bear. Exactly. When you started these projects, when you started uncovering some of these, and I know we'll, we'll probably touch on some of the other ones and, and what we covered last time, it's amazing to me just how prevalent these stories of vampires and werewolves and even, as we were joking last time, mummies even turning up uh, in some of these newspaper reports, which, especially the mummies as well, because... Obviously, at the beginning of the 20th century, most of Europe went Egyptology crazy with the discovery of, finally, of Tutankhamun, especially where everything in, in the UK in the 1920s, John, seemed to be focused on mummies and pharaohs and curses and strange creatures. So when we were discussing it last time, we were looking at some of these other mummified creatures that were still there that were sort of 40, 50 years before that kind of thing even became popular in in a wider sense. Yes, and, and just for anyone listening, to be clear, I, I never found any stories of like a mummy coming to life or anything that <laughs> exciting. But at least, you know, we, there were stories of cursed mummies, and one of the cursed mummies was the assassin John Wilkes Booth. So allegedly they had his mummy, and it was cursed and caused a circus train to derail. And it's it's too long to get into here, but that's the sort of stuff I have in the, the mummies book, just interesting cursed mummies. Yeah. Yes, and it's one of those strange things that, I mean, not just that particular 
as in Wilkes Booth, but often there was um, many a, a criminal who would be mummified for the entertainment of the population who would come around and pay a few a few coins to come and see <laughs> see this person brought to justice. Yes. <laughs> Which, I mean, to be fair, there's a lot of strange things that passed for entertainment in those days, John, all over the place, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so were you sort of enticed from that last book? Was it the simple fact that once you had uncovered a few particular stories in certain creatures and, and cryptids and things like that, that you were then even more surprised at how many you began to stumble on, John? Or did you think, there's so much here, I've got to to carry on with this because you've just uncovered so many stories that really needed to be brought out into the modern era, into the, into the reader's availability, really? Yeah, so the developmental process of Cowboys and Monsters was I just figured I'd find a, a smattering enough stories to just make maybe a... 300 to 400 page book and um, the economics of book printing when you get over 400 pages uh, it doesn't matter your trim size or anything like that but when you when you're at 400 pages it kind of costs more to produce so you want to keep them you know around 350 to 400 max and I found so many stories for that book I finally figured out that there was too much for one book there was really enough for several but I kind of wanted to finish that book uh, as opposed to just dragging it on and on or, or taking the time to break it up uh, right away. So what I did is I finished Cowboys and Monsters, and basically I took the best stories that took place more so in the West. You know, they're, in Cowboys and Monsters, most of those stories do have kind of a southwestern slant. And there were other stories, though, that I found, like the Vampires of Exeter, Rhode Island, um, the Richmond Vampire of 1923, Stuff like that that didn't really take place in the West, I kind of set them aside and was like, okay, I'll do something with them later. And so what I did, and it wasn't like my intention to double dip, as they say, when you re-release something. But what I did, though, is I took every single vampire story I found, and I put it in a new book called Cowboys and Vampires. Then I did the same with uh, all the werewolf stories, did that in a book called Cowboys and Dogmen. Then I did the same again with all the mummy stories in a, in a book called Mummies of, uh, Mummies of the Americas. But what's cool about these is my cover artist, uh, Jolian Yates, he designed a mural type cover that he split into three. So basically, if you buy all three of these books, they make a trilogy that if you lay them out all together, the covers will make a mural that like blends into each other with a vampire, a mummy, and a werewolf. So it's really cool. Yeah, it looks fantastic. I must admit, I spotted that, John, and I just thought that was a really clever thing to do. Yeah, so again, it wasn't really like my intention to make people buy the books twice. It was just kind of one of those things that happened, and if I could do it over again, I'd, I might do it differently. But I will say this, though. Cowboys and Monsters has some other stuff in it that didn't really fit into the either the vampires, the werewolves, or the mummies. Because um, in Cowboys and Monsters, I have a story about Jack the Ripper and Benson, Arizona, that really didn't fit in this uh, this new trilogy I did. So if you have Cowboys and Monsters, you're going to have stories in it that are unique. Now, if you do uh, want the book that's just Cowboys and Vampires, it'll have every single vampire story from Cowboys and Monsters in it, and then a bunch of new ones. So I would say it's 60 to 70% new content and Cowboys and Vampires, and then the other 30% is uh, the stuff that was already published in uh, Cowboys and Monsters. Yeah, but I think it's good to be able to, to sort of bring back some of the greatest hits, because when you collate them, I think once again, as we were saying then, that, that just shows how prevalent some of these creatures were all over the place, because as you say, I mean, it, it's one of those things that often gets overlooked, I think, as you mentioned there. I mean, everything that was going on in, in the New England area with the vampire flaps. Oh, there's one, Paul. I just I know we're going to mostly focus on werewolves, but I just got to talk about this one. Yeah, go for it. So there were was a vampire epidemic in Mexico in the 1950s. And uh, what happened is uh, there was this rural state called Tlaxcala, where the government noticed these death certificates by the dozens for babies, and the cause of death was always sucked by the witch. Mm. And uh, the claim was that these babies were drained of blood in the night and killed by a, 
a shape-shifting witch. And so Mexico actually launched a government investigation into this uh, epidemic. And, you know, of course, the, you know, their explanation of it is kind of like, uh, I don't want to say of the Scooby-Doo variety, but, you know, they, they came up with a way to explain it that, well, really, these parents, they were just careless and they let their children freeze to death in the night and they blamed it on this folkloric witch. And that's the official explanation. But at the same time, they never really did any autopsies on all of these babies to confirm that, that they died of cold and not, you know, having uh, their blood suckled. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's not really a, a totally thoroughly investigated case. You know, um, I would say there's still plenty of evidence of the supernatural in it. But I just thought it was so fascinating that there was a yeah government investigation. It's strange sometimes when you see that because it's almost as if they decided they had an explanation for what was going on for this epidemic, John, and then just fitted everything under it just to put it to bed and, and make everybody calm down. Yeah, the government is almost always predictable in that they're like a parent that lies to their child. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, you know, it's like they won't tell them the truth about how babies are made or whatever, you know, because they feel like they can't handle it. That's really the analogy for government and the rest of us. Absolutely, absolutely. Keep us in the dark until they need us to turn the light on or something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've also got to say as well, John, to, to kind of dismiss those parents as being idiots and not knowing how to keep a child warm at night seems, I think that's what you would suggest is, is a hell of a reach, really. Yeah. Yeah, and a little bit. I guess you couldn't say racist because it's the Mexican government dealing with its native citizens, but they are implying that these rural people are stupid and careless, which is, you know, not very nice. And not really true. I mean, um, I'm sure that there's probably a few babies that might have died from cold or something, but I mean, there, I doubt that that many of them would have been that careless. Hmm. I mean, when you say the word epidemic, how many, how many would you be sort of leaning towards as a, as a, as a rough figure, John? How bad was it getting? I forget the exact number at this point, but there was a whole book written on it by the, uh, the doctor who, uh, investigated it, and it's called Blood Sucking Witchcraft. I think it's out of print now, but, hmm. uh, it would tell you, and it has, uh, I've seen it, it has charts and graphs, and it seems like it was up in the hundreds at least, if not more. Hmm. I mean, you'd also suggest, with the greatest of respect, John, if a doctor's writing about it, I think he would know the difference between a child being taken in strange circumstances and one suffering from cold or malnutrition, surely. Yeah, and he kind of rides the fence on it. Um, it's almost like he won't admit that maybe it really was a witch. Hmm. You know, so it's, it's one of those things that's... Uh, I don't know, but some people, I wish I could remember his name, but they call him the real-life Professor Van Helsing. But <laughs> anyone who's interested, you know, just Google blood-sucking witchcraft, the book, and the, you'll get the names and all that. Mm. It is surprising, especially when it comes to, to vampires, how these flaps will just appear out of nowhere. And we often look back at these situations, John, and think that these are stories that would only have happened two, three hundred years ago in certain parts of the world and yet i know i've joked there was a there was a big flap here in the uk in the 1970s which saw some very strange things going on in london and when you tell people about this and, and the same with what's happened in mexico and some of the cases that were going on in in new england at the beginning of the 20th century i think people find it really hard because the, I, I don't know what it is i think the presumption is that oh well we're in the modern enlightened era surely these creatures are nothing but superstition and yet here we are within 100 years, 50 years ago, that people really thought that vampires were running around still. Yeah, were you referring to the Highgate vampire thing? I was certainly that, was. Well, I'm so interested in that. Like, I, I almost would love to, if I had time, I'd love to write a book on that, but I don't. There's too many things going on, but that's fascinating. <laughs> it is, it is. I was joking. I was in London uh, for Halloween last year, and uh, we were having a quiet night in on the day before. And uh, there was a ma big documentary about it all. And I was only four, four and a half miles away from Highgate at the time. <laughs> so I was oh, a bit, geez. I was tempted. <laughs> yeah, I would be too. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the other aspects of all this is, is as we touched on in regards to, to werewolf stories, and especially these days, there seems to be three camps, I think, 
John, there's werewolves, there's dogmen, and there's skinwalkers. When you were uncovering these, obviously because you're dealing with a, a, a lot of people moving from different regions and different areas, primarily people would always sort of push the skinwalkers into, into certain tribal nations and indigenous populations and, and certain beliefs in that thing. Whereas I think these days I've noticed it more. Maybe it's because I've got more of an interest in this. Skinwalkers seem to be everywhere, whereas for most people who look back at some of the tribal lore, they're mostly Navajo skinwalker stories, whereas it seems that they're everywhere. And is this something that when you started uncovering these werewolf stories that you had this distinction back then, or were all these creatures described as werewolves? So believe it or not, the more uh, you dig into it, really they're all the same. And none of them that I've ever found are like a movie werewolf where they got bit by another werewolf and then they just transform on the full moon. Mm. Almost always there's there's a form of black magic and uh, what they will typically do is wear the skin of the animal they want to turn into, it, like be it a bear or a wolf or whatever it is. Uh, it really doesn't matter. They just wear the pelt. They usually will use like a magical salve or herbal supplement and then do whatever incantation they have to do to either transform or maybe they just believe they transform. But I wouldn't say they just believe that they transform because so many people like, like uh, our old friend Linda Godfrey, we were talking about earlier, you know, they, they find witnesses who really saw basically bipedal wolf like beings that look like an anthropomorphic, Anthrop what's the word anthropomorphized wolves yeah so i mean people do see these things and uh they're universal because the the werewolves of europe uh, i learned about them through daniel cohen's book werewolves that he kind of wrote for young readers back in like the 1990s but it's still a great book mm. and, and it introduced me to the the concept of real werewolves and how different they were from the movie werewolves and so even the werewolves in europe uh you know as popularized by universal studios and hammer you know they're they're a lot like the skinwalkers and again they just put on the animal pelt and they do the uh the black magic ritual whatever it is and then somehow they it's like the pelt helps them transform into kind of a half human half animal mm. i think th th this is it's one of those things it seems to be that films have kind of created in the modern era, this idea of how a werewolf is born. But as you say, a lot of it was to do with curses. I mean, I only recently, within sort of the last couple of years, discovered this tradition that if you were born at Christmas, there was a chance that you would grow up to be a werewolf, which is one of those things that I think, is it Curse of the Werewolf? That's the reason he becomes a werewolf, is that he's born on Christmas Day, I think. Yes, correct. So it's strange how... The old version, as you say, it's it's curses, black magic, bad luck, upsetting people, being born with the sign, because often sometimes it was classed as being a genetic problem that certain families would be, you know, the seventh son would turn into a werewolf or you would always oh, be marked right. for darker things as well. So it's it's interesting how it's now gone, oh, well, you can only become a werewolf if you've been bit, whereas... Yeah. When you look at all the old literature from everywhere, and even in, in the States, it's all to do with curses and bad luck more than anything, isn't it? Yeah, and also another odd one was if you drank rainwater from a wolf's footprint, you could also turn into a werewolf. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of them, though, like I've got this one in front of me. It's uh, from, let's see, where is this? I think it's from France in 1521. There was a man named Pierre Burgo. Mm -hmm. who was out looking for his lost sheep, and he claimed he uh, came along these three uh, mysterious men in black hoods that were riding on black horses, and they magically helped him to find his flock. And like in return, uh, Burgo sold his soul to the devil, and he was given a, a magic uh, salve that he could rub on his body, and that would turn him into a wolf. And he really was put on trial for that in the, uh, like I said, 16th century France. Yeah, it is quite surprising as well, because I think, once again, when you look back at that period of time, everybody thinks that people were being burnt at the stake all over the place and sent to death. But the French were really quite forward thinking in regards to, especially when it came to lycanthropy and people claiming to be transforming into wolves, that they suddenly realized that a lot of these people 
were sadly suffering from some form of mental illness and weren't doing what they said they were doing or they were just people who were just assaulting people because they believed that they were some kind of creature even though they had not physically transformed john and i think that's quite surprising that even in those days 300 350 years ago people were already beginning to suspect that there was a lot more to this whole mythos than just people claiming to change into beasts yes and then there's of course the famous beast of javadan yeah who, uh, you know I don't think there was really ever a human component to that, but it was just this big wolf-like predator, you know, in the uh, 1670s, killing all these sheep and people. And uh, why I brought up the Beast of uh, Jibadan is in America, we've had some similar incidences. Like in Kentucky in the 1880s, they had something called the Dog Eater. Mm. It was this mysterious cryptid that was kind of wolf big and wolf-like, and it would always, for some reason, go after dogs as opposed to livestock and that's why they called it the dog eater and in at least one instance it also drained the blood like a vampire mm. i mean that's something that we still see happening in into the modern era that there are these stories of certain areas um i think is it around the carolinas where you've had these spates of some kind of crazy creature turning up john taking dogs which i think is one of those things that people presume Certain dogs are immune to, to any kind of predator other than perhaps you would suggest a bear, really, in, in the wild. I mean, it obviously depends on which state you are in because there's obviously all kinds of creatures everywhere. But I know a lot of people will be surprised when they hear about how, how vicious packs of coyotes can be and wolves and things can, that, you know, will, will prey on domestic pets because they see them as easy prey. Whereas you still get these flaps where people claim to see a strange creature turning up that focuses purely on pets yes and let's backtrack to what you said about the carolinas because you you've hit on something i can actually remember from a, a recent book and speak to uh, you know because a lot of my books when we talk about them i wrote them like a year ago and they're not really fresh in my mind but when you said the incidents in the carolinas so in bladenboro yep. north carolina so you already know Bladenboro, huh? Yes, yes, I'm very okay. aware of that case, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that one was cool because they would call it the vampire beast. And again, it would mostly kill dogs. It would uh, drain them of all their blood. And it's very, very similar to the dog eater from 1880s uh, Kentucky, mm -hmm. just uh, in more modern times, in this case, in the 1950s. So it's it's interesting because you could read these articles with headlines like "Vampire Charges Woman" and "Vampire Does This." So it was uh, really odd, and you know they could never really agree on what this thing looked like. You know, some people thought it was a big uh, feline, you know, like a mountain lion type creature. Other people thought it was a wolf. And because of that, some people even think it was some sort of shapeshift. Hmm. And the most interesting incident, the very final one was uh, about a year after the, the main attacks, the creature returned, and it was seen in a schoolyard. I think it was uh, the Panthersville schoolyard, and the kids and the teachers, they, they both uh, corroborated each other's statements. They said that it looked like a wolf with the head of a monkey, and it also had a tail like a, either a lion or a monkey, which was pretty unusual. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing... When I when I read the section covering the dog eater, this is the same as what happened at Bladenborough, is that you have these incidents that happen for a specific period of time, John, and then they just seem to stop. And it's this is the one thing I've never really understood about the the normal predator explanation is that animals will tend to stay where they get food mm. because why why would you work harder than you need to? It's it, it's common sense. And these cases are always surprising that, yes, yeah, something may just turn up and think, oh, I've, I've, you know, I've got my own buffet here. It's uh, why do I need to move on from here? Because obviously a lot of creatures will will move on and have certain routes that they will take and they can go for hundreds and hundreds of miles. As we've seen with certain mountain lion cases in the modern era in, in the US. So I'm always as mystified as as not just as to why they start, as to why they stop. And the dog eater is another one of those where. Something had seemed to have been happening for for a while, and it seemed to have some real momentum. It seemed to be picking up, which often happens as well, John, that these cases seem to get more and more frequent. And 
and then they either claim that they've killed something that they're not really sure about, or it just stops. Yeah, why it stops uh, is always the the really puzzling thing, because like you just said, why would it stop if if there's no body produced and there's uh, ample food there? Now, of course, with most of those, they will claim that, well, we shot it, like with Bladenboro, they shot a mountain lion and said that was the Bladenboro beast, but still the killings continued after that. And again, you know, you really can't explain the the monkey faced uh, kind of dog lion hybrid that these uh, kids saw at the the Panthersville Elementary School. Mm, yeah, and often, as in with Blainborough, people were saying, "Well, that's not what I saw. And that's certainly not the creature I saw." And the, and the officials would go, "No, you're wrong. No, you 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 were mistaken. You were too scared to understand what you were seeing." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes you think, because often that's the same thing, you know, as we were talking about officials and, and uh, trying to explain things away. It's it's like um, it's like the scene in Jaws, John, where all the all the locals turn up, and they all go out and they all start killing every shark. They're going, oh, there, this is definitely the one. This is the one. This is the one. Just so they just want everybody to calm down and carry on spending money. And it's it, it, it's although everybody might look at that in a kind of tongue in cheek way because obviously it's a it's an incredible film and just presume that that's just done for the cinema when you dive into this particular these subjects and you see these certain cases it happens all the time that some mysterious some random creature will be killed and they go yeah that's the one it all stops now yeah i use that analogy quite a bit myself the the jaws analogy of killing the wrong shark and yeah yeah yeah, well, not everybody's going to sneak down to the dock and cut them open, though, are they, John? That's the thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was very surprised as well. There's a couple of stories in, in the werewolf book that really made me chuckle about unwanted love, John, from, from werewolves who seem to take a shine to certain people. The uh, story from Detroit, like Bride of the Werewolf? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's a very old folk tale. That you've got to wonder what's the truth to it. Uh, that one sounds a little more fanciful to me just because it's like it ends with the werewolf. Uh, like you think he dives into the lake and a giant catfish eats him or something. But I still had to include it, you know, because it's just old folklore. Yeah, it's it's surprising because there's a couple of stories like that where there's this unrequented love from uh, some canid for, for a human. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, these are some of the stories. I mean, there are... Many a strange story when it comes to to werewolves and living in plain sight as well. I think anybody who knows anything about the history of of werewolves in in the U.S. will probably I would suspect that the most famous one is the the werewolf of Talbot County. Well, let's see. I would uh, I would say it's more uh, Linda Godfrey's one that she discovered, the Beast of Bray Road, or that she popularized. I'd say that's probably the most uh, famous one. And, mm. Yeah. So the werewolf woman of Talbot. County though I was I always thought it was kind of a funny coincidence that the county was the same name as the character from the Wolfman Larry Talbot. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that one that one seemed to be an instance of a woman who was like hallucinating herself to be a werewolf, but she never was a werewolf. And it sounds quite a bit like the movie The Wolfman, where the story focuses on a a girl who turns into a werewolf, and it's like her mother who saves her. Towards the end of the story, which which may have actually happened, but I I think in the case of that one, it was just a mentally ill woman who thought she transformed into a wolf. Mm. And that one's got all the elements of of a posse going out to look for them, and somebody being wounded, and that's what gives it away. It's yeah, it's one of those as well. And and the fact that she then they send her away to Europe, and she comes back cured allegedly. Yeah, and I always wonder too. You know, is that a story that? Uh, was made up after the Wolfman, mm. and I probably knew it when I wrote it. You know, like if, if me a year ago gave this uh, interview, I'd be I'd give you better information. I'd be like, well, I researched it, and uh, no, it was a real story from the time period. And I I'm just so bad because I can't remember the details exactly. Hey, that's no problem. Don't worry. Um, I mean, it may be one of those because I've seen it before. It happens a lot in popular culture. John, there's clearly people who have a real interest in folklore and legends such as this that work in the in the world of film, because I find it very odd that Larry Talbot is called Larry Talbot if you know about the werewolf woman of Talbot County. Because yeah. for me, 
it makes I think it's one of those little winks to people. Yeah, and if it's not a wink from let's say the person who made up the story, you know, uh, assuming it's a made up story, we also have John Keel's theory that we have uh, he calls them ultra terrestrials or cosmic practical jokers. Yeah, uh, they're like interdimensional beings that play pranks on us to mess with our reality, mm-hmm. and that's where these improbable stories sometimes come from. So mm. who knows? Yeah, and I, I think because sometimes you get these stories and you just shake your head because even if you've got a love of monsters and cryptids, sometimes you will stumble across reports and behaviours or even creatures that just seem completely out of the box. They're just baffling. Yeah. When you were looking in the particular area in regards to, as you were saying, the southern western states, I think one of the things that seems to be really coming back into into fashion that people have sort of rediscovered, John, is is these stories of, of devil dogs or hellhounds, which a lot of people tend to focus on European stories about this. I'm very surprised to see how prevalent they are all over the US, but there also seems to be quite a few around the, the US and Mexican border, which is one of those where you think, well, where are these stories originating from? Which culture had this? Or is it something that, as you get with certain other creatures that it's all down to who moved to where and when i'm so glad you brought up the hellhounds because that was my one of my favorite things to write about more specifically uh is the fact that mexico instead of oh, they have a hellhound but they also have like a heavenly hound that is white that i thought was so cool mm. and before i go any further i want to give credit to where i found this it's it's from a really awesome podcast slash blog called Mexico Unexplained. So if you're interested in Mexico and its supernatural folklore, so much cool stuff there. And that's where I found it. So in Mexico, they call their hellhounds cadejos. And it has something to do, I think the root word is something with the cadejo. It has to do with like a chain that is sometimes wrapped around their neck. I think the the root word is the the Spanish word for chain or something, and that's where it derives from. But mm. but yeah, they they have three different types of cadejos. Like one is purely spiritual, like it's kind of like a ghost that is incorporeal that you can't really touch. Then they have a second variety that is like a physically evil incarnated dog that can be shot and killed. And according to the lore, if you kill this dog. It's like the ground will be forever stained where it died and nothing will grow there. And then lastly, they also have a third variety, which is a uh, a half-breed of a supernatural cadejo mixed with a real dog. So it's kind of like half-dog, half-supernatural. And then finally, they also have a white cadejo, which is good, like it's from heaven and it can kill the black cadejos. Or it, can, it might show up. When you're walking along a lonely road and it will walk by your side, the idea is it'll protect you from evil, or it'll, if you're lost, it'll lead you back to civilization. So I thought that was really cool. Mm-hmm. Do they have the similar kind of rules that seem to apply to some of them here? That it can only travel to certain places, it can't cross bridges or go over water, John? I don't think so. I um, So in America, I haven't really gotten enough hellhound stories yet the only one i really remember is the hell dogs of hell dorado canyon and nevada yes. which i think might be folkloric but i don't care this it's just really <laughs> cool that we have a place called hell dorado with hellhounds you know you can't pass that up <laughs> well yeah that's one of those stories where you think it's it as we were saying about certain other aspects of the of the supernatural there, there's a kernel of truth in it because obviously this place was a very lawless unapologetic get what you can and get out kind of place where people were just turning up mining shooting each other fighting over drinking women and and gold and then just running off and it seems that it's one of those where you had a big gold rush everything got mined or as much as they could possibly get to and a lot of these people had their dogs and and sadly they either killed them or just left them behind didn't they yeah and held dorado canyon and then Years later, there were a few campers in the canyon, and they're the ones who claimed that they saw the the ghost dogs and they heard their chains. And I thought the chains was interesting because the chains tie into the cadejos from Mexico. So there's always these correlations uh, with these animals. Mm. You often get these stories, like you say, that there are people who see the chains moving, there are people that hear scratching or whimpering, 
and nothing being there. But you've also got some of these encounters where people will be riding on their horses and they claim to have been followed by some kind of strange pack of dogs that always seems to keep pace with them regardless of how quickly they they move on. Yes, and so that ties me into something else I wanted to bring up. That is, in Europe and in terms of the skinwalkers and even in terms of the hellhounds, the werewolves, again, as opposed to some tragic figure who got bitten by a wolf, they're usually witches that are, or warlocks that are willing and complacent in what they're doing. And in New Mexico, a lot of times the hellhounds are really just thought to be a witch out in dog form. And New Mexico has a lot of stories about someone they'll see either they'll see either a black dog, an owl, or maybe even some sort of mountain lion, and they'll shoot it. And then the next day, the town witch will show up with, uh, like, let's say. Maybe they'll be missing an eye if they shot it in the eye, or maybe their arm will be bandaged if they shot it, you know, on the foreleg or something. So there, that's a very classic tale in New Mexico and Mexico, parts of Texas, that you shoot an animal, and the next day a human will appear with a wound in the same spot, and that human is always thought to be a witch. So I think that's uh, kind of an interesting part of werewolf lore that's, that people kind of forget about it because they lump it in more so with witches. Mm. I mean, there's one story that really made me chuckle, which is called the Vegetarian Werewolf, John, which is about, oh, right. yeah. uh, <laughs> which is about one seen in California, I think, which was spotted gen- gently picking berries and shoots as though it was, it had decided to uh, forego eating meat and had decided to just go for a, a, a plant-based diet, which really made yeah. me chuckle because it's, it's quite odd when you, some of these stories, you know, as we were saying about them being repeated or tall tales, for somebody to create at the end of the 19th century a story about seeing a, a, a vegetarian werewolf, I find very odd. Even if even if it is made up, John, it's a very yeah. strange story to create, especially in that day and age. That's something else that I always say is if you're going to make up a story for entertainment, I would say you need... Uh, a beginning and a middle and an end and kind of like a through line. But when they're just really weird and kind of pointless, as in I just saw this weird thing and it was doing this, and there, there's no um, really obvious satire in it, Like that's the one where I think, well, maybe that was just a real sighting, and that's why it's so weird and unexplainable. Mm. Would you – I know we were, we were touching about where some of these stories originate from. I think the other thing that often gets thrown into this mix is that people will say that, the loop guru is something completely different as well, John. Whereas, it, I suppose if you really look at it on face value, these are clearly stories of werewolves, but they tend to originate from people from French-speaking regions, don't they? Yes, the, you're right. There's more probably from France than anywhere else, and that's also why up around Lake Michigan, where there were a lot of French fur trappers, there were those uh, werewolf stories as well. Yeah, because obviously you've got werewolf stories that come from Canada too which yeah. once again had a, a, a large influx of, of French people as you you know as we know along the south coast more, more so towards the eastern side of the US obviously you, you've still got enormous volumes in regards to the loop guru and this once again it's slightly different but they they all seem to be magic and mysticism rather than the the traditional being bit yes and that's kind of like i was saying it always kind of comes back to some sort of magic or witchcraft as opposed to a a curse Hmm. because is it that if there's some kind of time scale with some of these loop guru stories that if somebody spots them they they either pass on the curse or they become cursed for a specific period of time and they they're not they they're not allowed to be seen for for so many days or so many months or something oh that's right i'm glad you brought that up i had forgotten about that one yeah you're exactly right can't remember the precise details but what flashed on my head with that one that i think listeners will find really cool is uh, one of the ways that you kill a werewolf as opposed to the silver bullet is you have to utter the werewolf's true human name. And a lot of times when you utter their true name, it takes away their power. And that's true of the loop guru, and it's also true of the skinwalker. Mm. Mm. So it's weird. You've got the French werewolf, and then you've got the Navajo skinwalker. And I don't, I really don't think the Navajo and the French ever interacted much. You know, there's not really a lot of French fur trappers in 
the homeland of the Navajo for them to have swap notes with. So that's interesting that the given name holds some sort of power that, that strips the werewolf of its abilities. Mm. It, yeah, there are always little things about this with populations that clearly had no contact. I mean, uh, as we touched on earlier, when you look at stories of, of Bigfoot or even werewolves, you can't... I mean, we, we know that the vast majority of, of tribes would not have had any kind of contact. And I find it very hard that people who lived on tribal lands in, in New Mexico and Texas would have a similar story to tribes and First Nations people who lived in British Columbia and Washington State and Michigan, John. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's that question of, of uh, how do people in different locations with no way of communicating with each other have the same stories and they see the same things. And I mean, an anthropologist will probably try to explain it away and say, well, they all descended from a common people with the common legend. But again, you know, you could just say they really are seeing these things and that's why they talk about them. Mm. I was surprised to see a couple of stories in regards to, to weir cats as well, John, which I think when we talk about weir creatures, they always get overlooked. And so you begin to think, where do these kind of stories originate from? Because obviously they've they've got their roots in Europe as as weir bears have i think that when you when you start to dive into the what can be a weir creature essentially a lot of them are p- people that transform into a wide variety of creatures primarily the wolf has been the most well known and the probably the most prevalent but even so you would still get people who would claim that they'd seen weir cats and weir bears which is a very it's similar but it's obviously different enough for people to distinguish that they're not looking at a dog faced creature they're seeing a cat or a bear that's right and so the apache as opposed to werewolves they tended to associate bears with the the were animal so that's interesting and i think skinwalkers of the navajo could also choose to wear a a bear pelt if they wanted and turn into a like a were bear mm. yeah yeah was that one of those that once again as we as we focused on the loop guru does that depend on the on the mixture or, or was that more a tribal law i am not sure about that one i just don't know hmm. Hmm. but it's interesting is it once again you've got you've got two completely different populations from halfway across the world from each other who have very similar stories yeah yeah and and actually paul would you repeat that first question again because i think i was i was thinking about something werewolf related and then <laughs> Go ahead and repeat it, because maybe I do know the answer. Ask me again. I'm, I'm trying to think now. <laughs> you asked something about the the skinwalker, I think, and the loop guru and tribal law. Oh yeah, was is there um is there a similarity that you've got these kind of parallels with the native populations and the indigenous tribes of of North America, John, and the immigrants that had moved over from Europe? That these stories seem to run parallel. Yeah. Yeah, I think the simple truth is just witches throughout the ages, uh, from the beginning of time has always, have always, uh, put on the animal pelt. They've done the incantation and taken whatever herbal supplement, either orally or by rubbing it, rubbing it on their body. I think that has just always been the case. And so it's, it's bled into all the different tribes and different peoples and beliefs. You know, I, I mean, when we, when we spoke the first time, I, I w- had to, admit how shocked I was about the whole witch Navajo ramifications and what happened after the Trail of Tears, John, and um, the persecutions of people claiming to, to be consorting with evil spirits and transforming into things. I suppose the more you get into this, because skinwalkers are so tied to one particular tribal nation, have you uncovered anything similar because once again you know we were talking about vampire flaps in the modern era and people poo-pooing it and thinking it's just old superstitions and yet i mean that happened towards the latter end of the 19th century which is one of those things that gets overlooked unless you dive into it and look into that particular period of history yeah so we're we're referring to uh we talked about the skinwalker purge of uh, 1878 which occurred in arizona um uh, it, it started off with some real witchcraft you know the basically chances are the first witch to be executed actually did kill someone and deserved tribal punishment mm. but then what happened and how it spiraled out of control is people realized i can get rid of my annoying neighbor 
or my enemy or the competitor for uh, this person I likes affections. All I have to do is call them a witch and they're going to go kill them and I don't have a problem anymore. So it got, you know, it got out of hand because of that. But uh, see, and I think this is another thing about our society is we like to act as though all of the witches were wrongfully accused mm. and a lot of them were, but not all of them. Some of them actually were witches that committed ritual sacrifice. Yeah. But uh, your original question though was, was kind of more about modern times. And uh, I think, yeah, people do still get accused of being witches uh, amongst Navajo. It's probably not as common as it used to be, but I would say it started to die out kind of around the 1950s. Mm. But the but prior to the 1950s, witchcraft accusations were still pretty high here in New Mexico. And in 1940, uh, a man actually went to trial here in New Mexico uh, and the charge leveled against him in all seriousness, no joke, and it's in the court records and the papers. The charge uh, leveled against this man was that he turned into a frog and bit his wife. <laughs> and that did, was the trial. He did what? Yeah, and here's what's really amazing. Everyone who lived in, in the little mountain village with this man was terrified of him. And this is how you know they were terrified of him. So during the trial... The judge posted a thousand dollar bail on this this witch, and the judge posted it because he thought he couldn't pay it. And to everyone's shock, this man literally pulls out a wad of hundred dollar bills out of his pocket on the spot and starts counting them off till he hits a thousand, so he can walk. And it turned <laughs> out that he had a racket going on where he would get the villagers to pay him protection money. Not so basic. It was kind of like how the the mob does. Yeah. You pay the mob not to destroy your business. Well, they would pay him not to hex them. <laughs> and so he was getting rich off of them. And they really believed he was a witch, you know, or, or maybe I should, he was a witch. But maybe what I'm trying to say is these people really believed he had the ability to shape shift. And they also believed, again, this is the year 1940. They believed that he had recently turned a man into a donkey as like some sort of punishment or curse. Yeah. What a strange thing to claim somebody changed into, though. John, you would not, with the greatest respect, if you were thinking of fearsome creatures. Mind you, I suppose if a six-foot frog comes at you, you're in trouble anyway, aren't you? Yeah, and that was my thought, too. And I, I tried really hard to get the specifics of, was he a giant frog? Was he a little frog? What was it? And some people think that uh, the wife and her cousin or sister beat each other up and then blamed it on him mm. is one of the theories that goes around. So who knows? Yeah. Wow. I mean, that, as we were saying about Keel and, and uh, cosmic tricksters and things, giant frog stories are always a bit peculiar anyway. And obviously the, book, yeah. the most famous is the, is the whole Loveland frog, which is one of those that's got one of those explanations that doesn't really sit well if you know anything about frogs. Yeah. Um, but that's a very strange thing to say somebody's changed into, especially when you think about the traditions and the folklore. If you were going to make up something, you would say, oh, he's turned into a into a, a large cat or a or a werewolf, John, surely, yeah. didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I tried to rack my brain why a frog, and the only thing I could think of was there's talk of, like, frogs in the Book of Revelation, but I, I don't think that was it. But mm. who knows? Who knows where they got the frog from? Mm. I think one of the most surprising chapters is focusing on the legendary folklorist Frank Doby, John. Oh, I'm glad you know who that is all the way in England. I'm impressed. yeah. Now, Doby is a man who wrote extensively, one of those wonderful people that has gone out, went out of his way to kind of collate as much local stories and legends and myths to keep them into the modern era. And I think it's something that really seemed to drop off a lot after sort of the latter part of the 20th century. And I think now, in this era of, of social media and, and self-publishing, a lot of it seems to be coming back to the front of people's minds, John, which is a brilliant thing, really, because some of these stories, as we're talking, I mean, imagine never knowing about a, a man that changed into a frog and bit his wife and going to court. It, it's fascinating for me when I look at regions around the world and they've got such a rich history of, of wonderful stories wherever you look. If you, if you look hard enough these days, you can find something that will amaze and astound you. Doby was one of those people that clearly had a real passion for folklore and legend and, and went out of his way to try and collect as much as possible, isn't he? Oh, yeah. I love Doby. Doby even inspired me to write a novel 
that's kind of weave, woven together through the different folklore of the Southwest that I might briefly mention later because it has a skinwalker in it. But uh, the story about Dobie and the, the – uh, not exactly a skinwalker. So there's a story in Cowboys and Dogmen about Dobie. It's a, basically – it's about a witch that turns into a cryptid, as interesting as that sounds, because Mexico has a cryptid cat called the Anza, mm. which is just this unclassifiable – big mountain lion that nobody can ever catch but different people see but basically the story is that Dobie and his hunting partner they actually shot and killed an Anza and uh, they run across this tribe of, of native people just walking through the desert and they see the uh, the mountain lion and they point out how it's it's missing some of its toes and they tell him well that's because we killed we there was a witch in our village and we cut off some of her fingers and that must have been the witch in her uh you know, animal form that you just killed. But it turns out, though, Dobie just integrated himself into that story. So it's, eh, I'm not going to say it's not true. I think Dobie just heard this folktale, and then he decided to integrate himself into it to make it a little more interesting to his readers. So that story kind of taught me to be a little bit weary of Dobie as far as the facts go sometimes. <laughs> Well, I suppose it's one of those that if you find a story that's so interesting, often, as we were saying about people looking down the noses at at, uh, at certain people from their backgrounds, John, or, or their upbringings or their education or their rurality in regards to not living in the city and therefore not being civilized or whatever. Yeah. Then obviously, I think Dobie was one of those people who had a real passion for it. And I think he would just expect people to, to be disinterested unless he could kind of bring it front and center and say, I know this has happened because it, it was me. Yeah. And that was, of course, the days before the Internet when you could Google these things and really research stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, because he, you know, back then that wasn't an option. <laughs> when you look into dogmen and werewolves, are you surprised? Because I think with Linda Godfrey's body of work, bringing the Beast of Bray Road into the modern era from, from when that started... I think, as as with that, everybody kind of thought, oh, well, everything started in Bray Road at the beginning of the 90s. And once again, it's one of those that once you open that box, you realise that people had been reporting things like that for at least 100 years, John. It wasn't just a modern interpretation. And because, once again, as we were talking about the internet and Googling things, when the Bray Road flap started... These people would have had, you know, it's not like they'd, they'd read a story on the internet and gone, oh, well, I'm going to pretend to have seen that. There would have been no way for people to create a creature like a, a dogman or a werewolf to be running around this particular area of, of the US from nowhere. It, you have to think, once again, you know, we're talking about creatures appearing from nowhere and then disappearing again. Why did it just start at the beginning of the 90s? And you can see that happens in a lot of these stories about these strange creatures, especially when you're talking 100 years ago. Something just happens and it all goes mad for a bit. Yeah, it's it's uh, hard to define and quantify. It's just uh, that's why we I think that's why I kind of gravitate towards John Keel's ultra terrestrial thing with these cosmic practical jokers that make no sense and they're just kind of here to confuse us <laughs> well it makes as much sense as, as as any other explanation john if nothing else i suppose when you're diving into this as as we've shown we've you, you've created this marvelous trilogy focusing on on them are you still uncovering new stories that you've thought oh i'm just gonna have to do something else here because did you with your love of history and, and archival research, let, know what you were letting yourself into when you discovered those first few stories. No, and I mean, again, it really dates back to 2011 when that movie Cowboys and Aliens was coming out, and Noe Torres and I just decided, well, there's all these old accounts of UFOs in the Old West, let's do a book. And at, with the advent of, like, newspapers.com and newspaper archives where all these things are digitized and you can search them, it just opened the floodgates for stories about dinosaurs and werewolves and all these things in the Old West that you didn't think uh, existed back then you know you thought they were just movie creation hmm. i mean the dinosaurs ones always really intrigued me because once again as, as we we're talking about mummies in egypt and all that dinosaurs are one of those things that these days i think people just presume we've always known about them but 200 years ago nobody had the first idea what a dinosaur was yeah exactly so do you think this is similar to 
some of these stories that we get out of Australia? So I know you've you've done some research in regards to strange creatures wandering around the the outback out there, John. And these stories of of these giant creatures running amok or, or running all over the place in in Australia have been around for a very long time. Once again, it, you know, we're talking forty, fifty, sixty years. People were reporting stumbling across giant lizards in the middle of nowhere out there. Yes, I did do a book finally on, because it kind of matched the cowboys and dinosaurs theme, because Australia has a big cattle industry and, and cowboys that they call jackaroos and stuff. Mm. So I did a book called Cowboys and Saurians, Dinosaurs Down Under, which talks about Burunjor, which is this T-Rex that allegedly like raids the cattle pens and kills livestock. Uh, but I will say, though, if you're really interested in dinosaurs in australia don't buy my book my book's just kind of like a gateway into the whole thing if, if you're really into that buy the books of rex gilroy who's the uh i believe the premier australian cryptozoologist and he has those, these really thorough books on burinjor and, and just different australian cryptids that are really neat so those are really make for fascinating reads yeah i mean there's something about that area of the pacific where there's some wherever you go there's islands all over and, and obviously of course you've got the stories of the komodo dragon john which people used to dismiss as a tall tale until one tried eating some <laughs> yeah. and then they went oh hang on a minute there's a there's a nine foot lizard here that likes to eat people um <laughs> um and and you still see see horrific stories these days of, of, of what komodo dragons will do if given the chance and, and and as with most predators they will usually go after smaller prey children unfortunately but i've i've seen interviews with people who have been asleep and been woken up in the middle of the night by something munching on their toes yeah which is never never a nice feeling john yeah <laughs> <laughs> so as as you've alluded to you've been working on a on a on a book diving more into uh, the werewolf yourself haven't you so yeah i was i was referring to i i did a novel finally but uh, so I, I, you know, a lot of people feel like they're wasting their time if they read a novel because it's purely fiction. Uh, and there was a New Mexico author who had a lot of success named Tony Hillerman, mm -hmm. who what he would do is he would weave real uh, facts about the Navajo Nation into his murder mysteries involving these two Navajo police officers named Jim Chi and, and Joe Leaporn. And they became very popular because people knew they could learn as they read. They would get some real history about New Mexico and the Navajo when they read these mystery novels. So this this was also my goal. I wrote a book called Once Upon a Time in Fort Sumner. And the villain of the book is a skinwalker who wants revenge uh, for the atrocities of the long walk. Mm. And so when you read the book, it, it is fictional, but you'll get a lot of real history about the long walk, about Billy the Kid about how skinwalkers work, like uh, something I used is uh, to become a skinwalker. This is this is true according to tribal lore. To become a skinwalker, you have to kill your sibling, or if not your sibling, a close family relation, and somehow that's what gives you the powers. Mm -hmm. And then I think to kill a skinwalker, you either need to have like a bullet or a knife that's dipped in white ash, Mm. And I use that, or you have to use the skinwalker's real name. And so, you know, so if you read the novel, it's it's a fun little murder mystery adventure story, but you will learn real facts about New Mexico and skinwalkers and Billy the Kid figures into it as well. So, mm. so is that a case of building a historical framework and then fitting your supernatural narrative through it, John, as you refer to, you're talking about the long walk and fort Sumner and and billy the kid so these are these are sort of tent poles that people are very aware of these are historical characters and incidents that occurred so do you find it easier to sort of set up these bridging points that have happened and then weave your story around them yes exactly and and the backbone of the whole series because uh, there's going to be more of them the backbone is the hero twins and the hero twins are common to both North and South America, all the indigenous peoples uh, have legends of these two twins who – they call them the hero twins, but they also call them the monster killers. And it's like their job to kill the monsters or the giants or whatever that inhabit the land. So <laughs> the books are essentially about the modern version of the hero twins, which in this case, you know, they have to fight a skinwalker in this book, which, uh, again, if you're interested, it's called Once Upon a Time in Fort Sumner. Fabulous. 
Fabulous. So clearly, as you were referring to that, that gave you a an appetite to continue the series then, Joe. Yeah, I, I plan to do a lot of them. And in that same vein, I also I got made a co-host on this podcast. So here's the name. It's called Plot Pit. You know, P-L-O-T-P-I-T, Plot Pit. And what we do, the, the creator, his name is William Atkinson. Mm-hmm. And he had this really neat idea where what we do is we take about three real stories. It, it can be real newspaper articles. It can be real folklore, real events. But but basically, the goal is to find three unrelated true stories, and then in real time, in about 20 minutes, we will craft like a movie or book outline out of these uh, story elements. And <laughs> on one of the episodes, what we actually did is we used the trilogy we've been talking about on this episode. So it was myself, William, and another author named Beverly Coots, and each of us had a book. I had Cowboys and Dogmen. Beverly had mummies of the Americas, and William had cowboys and vampires. And we said, okay, we're all going to pick a random story from each of these books, uh, and we can't corroborate with each other. We just have to pick the story, and then live on air, we're going to form a story out of these three that we've collected. (laughs) And uh, I picked uh, one about a werewolf in Canada that gets killed with a golden bullet in the 1880s. Beverly picks the, the chapter on the Spyro Mounds of Oklahoma. Yeah. Of like the 1920s, which is basically where they found uh, these Mesoamerican remains in Oklahoma that kind of had ghosts and curse revolving around them. Mm-hmm. Then William picked a story about a vampire skeleton discovered in like the 1890s. And so, again, our challenge was, OK, in 20 minutes, we have to make a working story out of this. So what we did is we decided that uh, the guy from Canada who killed the werewolf with the golden bullet in the 1880s, he becomes a monster hunter, mm. and he's got to find these cursed bones. And, uh, you know, so you've got the cursed vampire skeleton from Nevada, and then you've got all the cursed bones from Spyro Mounds. And the story as we evolved it live on air was that, uh, okay, so it turns out that this monster hunter, he's gone bad, and he actually wants to to conjoin these evil bones to get these special powers. And so then the monster hunter's younger apprentice has to uh, – become the hero and take down their mentor and it the story just kind of wrote itself like i said in real time in about 20 minutes so if you like stories but you also like to learn real history plot pit is kind of interesting in that regard and like last week we did uh the green comet that recently passed over earth and we joined it with the green fireball wave of the 1940s and also the lore of the green man and made a story out of that (laughs) So you certainly have to have your wits about you, John. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. It's a fun challenge, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Well, I suppose with someone who loves cinema as much as you do, and especially some of the, the weird and wonderful monster films that have been released over the yeah. years, I suppose it's uh, it's rich pickings for someone with such a, an interest in that. Yeah, and like another episode, I have my friend Neil Reby on. Neil writes dinosaur novels. So for Neil, we just took the famous tombstone pterodactyl story of 1890 and we didn't (laughs) add anything to that one in terms of other stories we just took that one story and decided okay we're gonna make a 1950s monster movie based off of the tombstone thunderbird as a jumping off point so that was another really fun one that turned out extremely well Mm. i think i'm i'm surprised the the more i speak to you john the more prolific you seem to be getting and i know you've got you've got several projects coming up i know you you you're looking at doing a wonderful book about witchcraft so how did you come to that was that once again uncovering these stories during the research for some of the previous books you've done or is that something you've always had an interest in yes yeah, so you know i live in new mexico which has uh, out of all of the the states in north america has pr- a pretty steep history in witchcraft especially in the colonial era and part of it was I planned to use that the witchcraft uh, mythos and you know the series of novels I'm doing on the heroes the hero twins, hmm. but the real stories were just so interesting I wanted to write about them just in their real historical context. So hopefully that'll be out by this summer. Ah, so uh, I suppose uh, is that uh, one of those wells that you're amazed how deep 
these stories go and it and it's something that's still going on to this modern era yes because initially with the the book on the history of the witches i envisioned it as a small little book maybe for the history press because they like short little 120 page books for the tourists to pick up and uh i started with that in mind and as i got into it i was like no i can't do this it's got to be a really thick scholarly book with all these footnotes and, and every story <laughs> i can find so now it's it's getting pretty big and it's not I couldn't even pitch it to the history press anymore because they like smaller books. So it, it'll be another one I probably just self-publish. Uh, so have you got any other projects keeping you busy? Because I'm you, the more I, as I say, I'm, I'm amazed you've got as many hours in the day to do everything you're doing, John. Oh well, yeah, and I sometimes I have to admit. So I start these projects because if you don't start them when they're fresh in your mind, you're going to forget about them or you'll lose the inspiration. But the problem is once I start them, they're like these little strings just pulling at me, and I want to finish them. Like right now, what I'm trying to finish is a book on unproduced dinosaur movies of the 1960s and 1970s. And then on the other end, I've got the uh, the New Mexico witch book that's still unfinished. Then I'm writing a novel about Billy the Kid. So at some point, I need to take a break or just focus on one thing and not go back and forth between so many. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you're keeping busy, and I will always be entertained and look forward to anything you've got coming up, John. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and the newest book I think that would interest you and, and your listeners is Cowboys and Saurians in the Modern Era, which covers things like the uh, Texas pterodactyl of 1976. It covers the Bladenboro Beast, uh, just kind of more modern cryptid stories, but kind of still with that Cowboys and and uh, Saurians feel to it, you know, and that they were maybe taking place in rural areas and, you know, stuff like that. Mm. I think that's the surprise when, when we still get these reports of people seeing, especially when it comes to pteranodons and large flying reptiles all over the certain parts of the U.S., John, that, that people seem that, once again, they seem to just poo-poo it and, as, as misidentification. But I think often... These people are very aware of the creatures that should be there. It's the fact that these creatures shouldn't be there that's what surprises them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even with the Texas uh, pterodactyl, the more I researched that one, it also had just a, a few little traces of uh, kind of witchcraft adjacent stories that I learned from New Mexico. Because, mm. uh, you know, one of the uh, so called pterodactyls had like a bat like face and it attacked a man outside of his home late at night and it just really sounded like something that if it had been reported back in the 1770s as opposed to the 1970s they wouldn't have said it's a dinosaur they would have said oh it was a witch out flying and it attacked me so that's kind of interesting as well mm, brilliant so where can everybody get hold of your work john follow you online and, and keep up to date with what's going on i finally started a website it's uh bicepbooks.com so if you go on there it's got all of my books that I talk about on here and you know uh, you just click on them and it'll take you to their Amazon page but it's you know but it's got all of my books in a nice orderly fashion that way or just type in John LeMay on amazon.com and you know you'll eventually find my author page and it's a little overwhelming because my author page has a fanzine on it that I publish, and the fanzine has a lot of issues. Yes. So it, yeah, so it will say that I've published 111 books. I haven't. I've, I've published like 40, but it, on, if you go on my Amazon author page, it'll say something like over 100 books, but it's, it's really just issues of the fanzine and stuff like that. Brilliant. Well, I'll put links to everything as always in the show Thank notes. You. And, uh, John, thank you for coming back. It's been lovely to catch up with you and uh, dive into some of these strange stories involving werewolves from around the Americas. Thank you. Maybe maybe another six months or so I can come back again. I'm always happy to talk to you. Absolutely. We'll have to uh, chew over. Maybe we could get our teeth into vampires. Pardon me. Yeah. Pun. <laughs> yeah, sounds good to me. Well, listen, thank you as always. You take care. It's been lovely to catch up with you, and we will speak again. Look after yourself and stay safe. Thank you, Paul.